Hi, this is Dr. Kimberly Leonard. I'm the author of Visualizing Happiness in Every Area of Your Life and hosted this podcast, Incredible Life Creator. And my guest today is Luz Wright. Luz was born in Bogota, Colombia. Her parents had a passion for nature and traveling. Since her early childhood, she has enjoyed being surrounded by our natural world. Luce's family used to spend long weekends and school holidays in the eastern plains of Colombia, a place with, without electricity and running water. And not only that, but Luce has been on many adventures over her life. I'm just going off script here, um, backpacking across the world. She has beautiful photography, and that's how we met, because um, she co-wrote a book with uh, Stephen Wing, and I had him on not that long ago. He's the poet. She's the photographer. So welcome to the podcast, Luz. Thank you so much for having me here, Kimberly. Yes. So happy to have you hear your stories. And um, I think you just have so much to offer. So let's just start out by you telling us about you, like how you started out, how the different things you've done and just how you got to be doing what you're doing now. Everything started out when I was very, very, very young growing up in Colombia. Uh, as you mentioned, my parents were big travelers and loved nature very much. I remember very well going in the weekends to uh, the western plains of Colombia, where it's wild. It takes it, the time it took hours and hours and hours to get to this place. And when the sun started coming down, I remember hearing the sounds of insects coming from different places, and I was amazed and fascinated. And so I just stayed there and listened to the sounds, and then I started seeing them. <laughs> and they come in very different colors and very different shapes and very different ways of moving. Some fly, or they hop, or they just jump on you. And stuff. I was just fascinated by the small creatures and, the, and how beautiful everything comes during the daytime and nighttime in surrounded by nature. After uh, a few years, I moved to France, to Paris, and that's when my, my adventures backpacking through U Europe started. I was in my early 20s, and I started meeting people that did a seasonal work with the backpacks that crosses all Europe doing it for their, they were the lifestyle was just doing that. And I found that being fascinating. So I say, okay, let's get my backpack. I just have my sleeping bag with me. And I left party, I was living in Paris at the time. And I left to the South when my brother was living in Montpellier. And I started just visiting farms and saying, uh, do you need a job? I'm looking for a job, do you need someone? And then I finally <laughs> find someone that got me a job. And I was picking up plums, the white plums from the trees. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, I met my my second husband, who is my daughter's father. I was up on a tree and he came in with his bike. He's an American born in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. He was turning in France as a person after he finished his bachelor's degree. His parents told him he, he, was, he wanted to do that. And so he joined me in my venture. And so we spent about a year. We traveled from Paris all the way to Greece. Mm -hmm. We had no place to sleep. Whatever <laughs> <laughs> the night felt, that's where we spent our my sleeping bag. He has a tent, which was good in, in for the rain and other conditions. So we were just doing an adventure. It was a beautiful, liberating experience. Quite oh, beautiful. Beautiful. Um, yes, go ahead. Oh, oh go ahead. <laughs> when I first arrived to Paris, I got my very first camera. I moved from Barranquilla, a very small town in Colombia, to Paris, giant city. Imagine, this was really amazing place for me to be. Didn't speak any French at all. But my, my first husband, Daniel, gave me a camera. And that what got me into taking photos and photography. And that's how I discovered the beauty of the city. And I got lost many times and I got found myself again many other times. And it was just the perfect place to get to know the, the city and connect with the camera. It was a beautiful first starting point. <laughs> yeah. So um, when you 
were in Paris. Is that when you had your daughter or when did your daughter come along? My daughter came along with my second husband, who is Rick, the one that I met when I was picking crumbs up in the tree. He's from Connecticut. After we traveled for nine months crossing Europe, he got very tired of it and it started getting cold. It was December, December, November, December. <laughs> and he invited me to come to Connecticut and uh, I said, oh, yes, let's go to Connecticut. And then we came, we got married and a child was born right after that. Yep. Beautiful, beautiful. Yep. So I lived in Connecticut for almost 12 years and then I divorced my first, second husband and then I moved to, to Atlanta after that. Okay. And that's where... We're meeting here. It is yes, we are right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and um, you co co-authored a book, Wild Atlanta, where um, uh, Stephen Wing is did poetry, but then you made the pictures for it. Do you want to talk about that? How that happened? How you got together? Oh, that was an amazing project. That's a real beautiful experience and beautiful book, actually. It's I met Stefan at the at a fundraising for land trust community, like great land trust community. And he told me that he has been looking for a photographer for many years. And he told me about his project, Earth Poetry. And I have to say yes, as soon as he said nature preserves and parks and community gardens. And then uh, we met in a in a in a coffee lounge and he showed me the list of the parts that he has already visited with all the poetry inside. And I had no idea that Atlanta has so many beautiful places to go out and discover. So to me, it was a complete uh, experience of just driving here, driving there, take a book, take a look at the list of, of poems that he, a park he has already wrote in poems. Pick one part, this one, it doesn't matter how far or how close it is. That's the one I pick. That's the one I'm going to go that particular day. And that's how it happens. So at the end of going through the list and I send in the photos to him that I have taken on those places, he said, okay, we're ready. We want to publish a book. And I'm, okay. <laughs> and then he said, all right, we have a publisher. We're publishing. And then he said, we have the party, a publishing party at, at this bookstore. And then he said, and then we have a, and then I'm like, wow, oh, this is happening so fast. I'm completely surprised about it. I say, yes. So that's pretty much what it happened. Mm -hmm. It happened just before 2020. So on 2020, when we were we were not allowed to, to go out for three months, it was a lot more restricted than the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. When it became a little less restricted, I started going out again, went out again. And that was the best time to be in the wilderness without any noise at all. Nature was blooming, birds, I mean, everything was coming out from everywhere. It was quite <laughs> beautiful 2020 year. Mm -hmm. And 2023, the book is published in June of 2023. So, yeah. And, you know, actually looking back at that 2020 time, I think a lot of people did re-experience nature for the second mm -hmm. time because because we were so restricted, mm -hmm. you know, we were allowed to go outside. So I think Absolutely. a lot of people started going outside. I mean, I've always been one. I like to go on walks in nature, but not everybody. A lot of people stay inside. So I think a lot of people started going outside again. Instead of being kind of mm -hmm. cooped up in their houses, <laughs> that's the positive part about it. Very positive part, especially because nature needs it needs the rest. It really does. Nature needs to be left alone for for periods of time, and that was perfect for it because it became stronger and it became more visible. So there were families out with young children, people by themselves, enjoying these beautiful opportunities to breathe after all this closed thing you know so it was liberating and powerful yeah, yeah yeah it really was so um what are you doing now are you still doing photography because you had mentioned several things you were doing um um the death midwife mm -hmm. and talk why don't you talk about that well i think it's 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 
Yes, everything comes together. Everything is kind of a whole. There's there's nothing is separated from nothing. Everything means togetherness and wellness. When I when I start doing the photographies and and this book and walking in the woods, that was right after I had the certification for the dead doula certification. I'm a dead doula midwife. Um, I, I observe how many trees are falling down in the forest. I observe how many leaves are dying on the forest. I observe how many bugs are dying. I observe life and I observe dying. They both are connected. They both are interconnected. So what I learned from going through this certification as the dual certification is that exactly, is how profound and complex human beings in life in this planetary existence, life existence, that is the death doesn't exist at the end. Death is a continuation of our lives. Our lives become something different. Our energy is just what creators are, and an energy continues uh, to walk to a different kind of energy. So when someone dies, I call it myself, that person is going to a higher level of consciousness. That person is transitioning into something that is higher than we are when we are alive. It's the same thing with nature. It connects with that. When the dead trees die, the dead tree is giving nutrients to the soil. It's giving food to the insects. It's giving food to other animals. It's giving space for all the trees to grow. It's living. It's also living as disintegrated into these little things that is becoming something else. Mm -hmm. That's the importance of connecting photography with dead and dying and connecting photography with life and with nature and what who we really are. Yeah, so, and you describe it so beautifully. So um, if you were going to be um, helping someone who is transitioning, what kind of mm -hmm. things would you do or say? Or how do, mm -hmm. I, I didn't even know there were death doulas. <laughs> so can you explain it to me? <laughs> it's actually being presence. Being presence and learn to read the energy of the person, learn to read the level of quietness or stressful or fear, learn to communicate without communicating, allow asking permission to the person if you are allowed to enter into that sacred space, meditation, meditation music, colors, candles, mm -hmm. singing, dancing, reading books is very unique so every person is completely unique mm -hmm. and the work is to to find out what is it that this uniqueness really needs to let go reading and don't worry about anything else we are all attached to things attached to words attached to what's happening attached to the past attached to the present attached to the future let all that go just mm -hmm. reading and Rest. Even as you're describing that is helping me to breathe, like <laughs> I was like, oh, was I holding on? <laughs> Maybe I was holding on and all of a sudden you just described it like that. It's like, oh yeah, I can breathe. <laughs> I went to Colombia. I was living in France. I had to let my job to take care of my mind when she was through the process of dying. She has been suffering for many, many years, and uh, one of my brothers was taking care of her, and she, he said, I'm exhausted, I need some help, so I said, I go, and I went and I spent the last three months with her. That's when I learned these languages, that's exactly when I learned what I just explained to you, mm -hmm. and it was a very beautiful, beautiful connection between this her spirit and my spirit, between the two of us, and... Uh, from there, I came back here in the USA. And then a year later, my dad was also going through his transition. He was living in Costa Rica. He moved from Colombia to Costa Rica. And so I went back to Costa Rica and I spent a couple of months with him and the same, same, same beautiful. Oh, that is just, spirit. I'm just feeling you know, honored even hearing you talking about that whole it's it's, 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 it's um 
It could be done at a distance, which I've been doing for the last few years, actually. It's not a very popular thing that you can get on the call. And, no, it's not. But I still do it. I still do it with friends, close friends, or close relatives that are in the transition or in the process of transition. And I do connect with them. Mm -hmm. And it helps. It really does. It really does. Just to be there, just to know that someone is there is completely, it's a healing. It's a healing, powerful exchange of energies. Exactly. So. Why do you think we have so much um, fear around death? Is it because um, we're leaving people we love or you know, a lot of times the fear is more in the people who aren't dying. <laughs> they, it's true. They don't, it's a... <laughs> they don't want their loved one to go. It is so true. It is so true. But when you when you when you grieve, you're expressing love. We human beings are very complex and you have very different feelings and emotions and they all are perfectly alright and correct. You need to grieve and when you grieve you're expressing love. I miss you, I love you, I know you are better, I know what you are. You made a huge part of my life, you know, accept that, be grateful for that person to be part of your life, mm -hmm. to come and to be what you are right now, to make you who you are right now. Mm -hmm. But it's also true that, that in the USA, there is a term, <laughs> it's a dead phobia society. It's, it's the conception that we need to change. We need to welcome it as we welcome life. I was I would celebrate a birthday or celebrate rituals or celebrate dancing or celebrate celebrate the same with we happen with the person is in transition. Celebrate that transition and keep it always sacred to you. It's just to change, but it, I think it's changing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I think there's more and more people interested in reading alternative uh, literature and getting educated on what is exactly that happens when people die or transition and why this society is the phobia society and why other societies are more acceptable and more. It's an interesting thing. It's very interesting. It, it is really interesting. And I, I wish I could remember the name, but I can't. I, I watched a movie not, not that long ago. Mm -hmm. And um, the mother in the movie was actually dying of cancer or something. She was going to, they mm -hmm. knew she was going to die. Mm -hmm. And so she decided that she would throw a big party for herself. <laughs> and she called, she called it, <laughs> it was her, her death party. In other words, it was her funeral <laughs> while she was alive. And so oh, she threw this big party, invited all her friends and all her family, and they all dressed up. And instead of waiting until she was gone, her friends and family all came up to the stage one by one. And they talked about all the wonderful memories they had with her, all the things they appreciated about her and loved about her. So instead of her being dead and everyone talking about her, everyone <laughs> was talking about her and she could hear everything they were saying. But I thought that was just, a, why don't we do that? Isn't that a wonderful idea? I think it's fantastic. Absolutely beautiful. That's yes. Crazy. I mean, we don't always know when we're going to die. I mean, there's sudden mm -hmm. deaths and things That's like right. that. But wow, if we kind of had an idea, we could do that. Yeah, there is home home funerals. There are home-based funerals, which are very, you design your own way, you design your own if you want to be in a casket of cardboard, I mean, disintegrating material, if you want to be buried in a green burial site, if you want to be whatever way you want to be, you can decide it with everybody and make part of the process and say, this is what I want, this is what I don't, this is what works for me, this is what is not going to work. But make it something social. Yeah, definitely. And make it something fun. Yeah. Something yeah. important. <laughs> So let's talk about some other things. Um, mm -hmm. So talk about your volunteering um, yeah. when you were supporting the refugees. Oh, that was right after I came back to Atlanta, which was seven years ago. Uh, uh, yes, it was people from uh, my Congo. I met a woman who has a, a program, Refugee Village, I think is the name of the program. And I went to visit 
her project and what she did is that she went to a a, a complex um, apartment complex in Clarkston. Clarkston is the place where most of the refugees that comes to the area are located. So it's a huge community. It's a beautiful place to go in and walk the streets or go shopping or the libraries. You see all these women with these beautiful dresses and kids and, and very, very colorful, very beautiful. And I volunteered for women. I went to the house of a woman to teach them English, basic English. And the one, so I started with one person, and then next time I went back, there was another one, and the next time I went back, there was another one. <laughs> so we were three three women in this place that I came every once a week to help the reading English. was very beautiful. Now, the women that founded this program also have uh, an intention, and it was to rescue the children of so this uh, complex, apartment complex, musical skills. They're very talented with the drums and their instruments and singing, beautiful voices, and especially with drumming with different kinds of drums. So she forms a group of kids that plays in different places in Atlanta and make different festivals, yeah. and they take them out, and some of them sing their songs, and others drum their drums in a stage in a beautiful festival. At the time, it was a refugee festival. It was before 2020. I'm not sure they're still doing it now, but it was a, a big festival in Clarkston. Some people from different parts of Atlanta, different ethnicities, different parts of the world were there and they were presenting their skills and their arts and their food. And so I was part of that project as well. Yes. And with the same person I met a woman who was crossing the border in a caravan, one of the caravans across the border from Mexico. She was traveling all the way to Honduras with three kids by herself, wow. all the way to Honduras and she made it. And she finally made it to California. And there was a player in California that contacted my friend in Georgia to have her come into Atlanta. So because there was no more space in, in California to house them and to help them out. So they came to Atlanta, they flew them to Atlanta, they followed them, the mother and the three kids. And so I got involved in that project as well. And by doing this project, I learned so much. I learned that there is a tremendous abundance in this country, in this world, in this universe. There is kids could have a free schooling, which is great. So I took care of their schooling and I took care of the medical needs. Kids that just little kids that just left their home, left their grandparents, left their pets, left everything, crossed this many, 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 many miles to get here. Just imagine, without any shoes, without clothing, without anything, just imagine the state, the physical and all, everything. So it was my big pleasure to help them to find what they needed in terms of doctors, in terms of education, in terms of transportation, in terms of getting their lunch, if they had the right to schools, in terms of having a translator to school, if they had the right to have a translator in school, interpreter. It was a beautiful open eye experience really was it sounds really really wonderful and you know it just makes me think that you know so many of us some some so, there's a lot of people who are refugees or who are immigrants to this country and you know you look at those people's lives and they they mm. come and then as adults they just give so much to the world but when they first got here they needed mm. the help they needed help of other kind people to help exactly. them along the way. And exactly. now they have a chance to, you know, add to the world, whatever exactly. the gift is. Exactly. It's not it's not their choice. There are other forces that force them to leave. It's not that you don't choose to do that. There's something terrible out there that you have to flee, that you have to go. So why don't welcome them? Embrace them, give them love, give them a little caution so they can rest you know they can get the strength that they need so they can yeah contribute to the country it makes a rich country with multi languages and multiple colors and multiple uh, contributions to society at large i mean it benefits all of us it benefits all of us at the same time it really does and now i know you've taught english many places talk about the different places that you've actually taught english to people <laughs> <laughs> the okay 
I created a program. After I left, I left the Atlanta about 10 years ago, even more than that. And I learned a job in Costa Rica at the school that uh, uh, brought people, the student, college students, college students to get Spanish level. They studied with Spanish and to have credit for their college education back home. These kids came from all over the country, but most, mostly from the USA, but they also came from different parts of the world. So it was a study abroad in, in, in Costa Rica. The program was very beautifully designed. It was four hours a day. Two hours were longer concepts. I have a master's degree from Georgia State University and I learned the longer structures. And uh, so we, we took two hours of longer structure and two hours for them to practice what they have learned these two hours within the little community we were living in it. It was a small community of fishermen and craftsmen and small stores, small restaurants at the time was really perfect for that. So when you have hands on what you are learning, you acquire the long cash no more fun, number one, and number two, faster, productive. From there, I left to France and I created a program to teach both languages, English and Spanish. So I have both groups, groups that came for English and groups that came for Spanish. It's exactly the same structure. <laughs> so we had two hours of longer structure and two hours of just visiting, visiting. Because I was living in a small town that wasn't that far from Paris. We did travel to Paris to do some Spanish Colombian restaurants. And then the English part was just around the town where we were. Small town, an hour and a half northwest of Paris, actually. So that's how I started there. From there, I went to I went backpacking uh, all, all around different countries in Europe and also in Costa Rica. When I was in Costa Rica, I backpacked all through Central America. And I did with the same project. You have no books, you don't need any notebooks, you don't need to grade anything, you don't need to pass a test, you don't need a deadline. <laughs> just, just please come and enjoy the, the lesson and then practice what lesson is about and that's it. And I lived doing that for almost nine years. It was, wow. it was just just that, just my backpack and having the person sitting and having the lesson with that person. So of course it was advanced, an advanced level of proficiency. It was more it was more uh, conversational and yeah. It sounds well. like that way you would learn faster that way. And when you say mm -hmm. no homework, I don't know about you, but <laughs> I know there's kids and even adults that go, oh, no homework. Okay, I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> I don't know if time I'm conjugating the Spanish verbs. I'm like, oh, I don't want to do these mm -hmm. verbs. I don't want to write these verbs anymore. Yeah. So yeah, many. Yeah. <laughs> it's a stressful. And for professor, for teachers, is this. I, I work at Georgia State. I work at different colleges around Atlanta. It's, it drains your life, it really does. You have deadlines and you have 30 students sitting right in front of you and you have to grade papers and grade homework and midterms and finals and that's it. You have your life just to do that. Mm -hmm. I found it a little, like not for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It sounds um, nicer out in the field. <laughs> and more fun. <laughs> exactly. Exciting. Yeah. 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 So I'm trying to see what else. Um uh the Sufi summer camp. What is that? Oh, 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 the Sufi. I started going to the so the American Sufi Foundation uh, about three years ago. It's located in New Mexico, about an hour and a half from Albuquerque. Um, it's in the middle of the desert. There's absolutely nothing nearby. Um, there is a community garden. There is a community kitchen. We all cook together. Uh, there are dorm for women and dorm for men. Uh, we share bathrooms, bathroom for women, bathroom for men. They're outside in a different building. There is no electricity during the night. It's completely dark, 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 dark. You get to see the stars, you get to see the Milky Way, you get to see the shooting stars, you get to... Ah, it's really an amazing place. It's a place that uh, is a practice that uses different modalities. 
He uses exercises, exercise your body. He uses chanting. He uses uh, praying. He uses dancing, belly dancing and the veil dancing. Mm -hmm. He uses it also the swirl that the Sufi people do, the dervishes do. Uh, the person that found it is Adnan Sarnan, who was originally from Iran, and he's an original dervish, and he came to the USA and he started the project, the program. He passed about two years ago, and but the students that have followed him for more than 30 years are the ones that are imparting the lessons today. When you go to this place that is absolutely open sky, desert, uh, quiet, really quiet. And you do the exercises and the chanting, and you do all of that. There is a time, there is a moment, there is a second that your heart just wide open, just just wide open. And there is a said by the Sufi people that say that this practice opened the intelligence of the heart. Mm -hmm. While opening the intelligence of the heart, there's just love for one another. Mm -hmm. There is not ego. The ego just fall. The presence is right there. What's the presence? The presence is the vibration of life, of the, the space, of the desert, of the people that are coming with you. And you are really... And so every time I go, I stay two and a half weeks to three weeks. Some people go and stay two full months. It runs for two full months in the summer. And it's a transformative experience. It sounds it like it. It sounds so wonderful. So on the times when you're not there, you're mm -hmm. at home, mm -hmm. you want to get that same experience in day-to-day. -day. Are there any practices you do every day or often that help you? I mean, you seem like you're so <laughs> present here in this interview mm. and you're so present with the people transitioning and then you, you go to the Sufi camp and even more open. So how do you keep that presence so you can just be in the present? What is it that you do? Any certain practices? Yes, yes, yes. I think of the woods. I go to the woods. I go to the woods as often as I can go. And I take and I take photos as often as possible. The woods have given me the presence that you can describe right now. Yes, mm -hmm. and there is uh, the dancing. Dancing is also very powerful, and it also brings intelligence of your heart. It also drops your ego down. I study dancing is once a month, every two months. But I say the woods. The woods give you give me a peace, and give me the quiet, but at the same time it gives me all the elements that are moving in there that you don't see when you first come in, but when you sit down and breathe deeply and connect with it and meditate for a little while, you start hearing sounds, some things that start just popping out from different places. And then you see how the sun is touching every single leaf in the woods. And you see a pattern. You see it's perfect. It's perfection. You see why this red or soul is hidden right here, and what is that shape in there, and what is this other one in here, and this other one in there, and you see, it's like it's like a geometric pattern that you just feel to you in your eyes. It's, it's it's to see that and to see that you are that too, because you are that. You're not part of it. It's beautiful. It's magical. <laughs> it really it's, is, it's, and just to imagine that we are just part of this whole beautiful kaleidoscope of what is the earth in the world mm. beautiful life is beautiful and vibrates that that within ourselves in a very intensive way a very profound way mm. yes yes it does. and anybody can go in the woods now if you <laughs> can't walk or you are in a in a wheelchair you might need help from someone else but we <laughs> all can go outside somewhere and enjoy nature. Exactly, exactly. Take time for yourself and go and enjoy nature. Mm -hmm. And look at the flower and look at the flower and really, really look at the flower. Spend a few minutes looking at the flower. <laughs> and then you see what happened. This flower is not just red and white, it's something else. You know? it's, yeah. yeah, 
That is beautiful. so true. I remember growing up, my mom used to say, mm -hmm. take time to smell the flowers. Mm -hmm. In other words, don't just rush by. Take time. Mm -hmm. Look at the flowers. <laughs> smell the flower. And, you know, I didn't know she was giving me life advice, but it really is. It really is. It really is true. Take time to smell the flower. There's no rush for anything. Yes. So um, we've talked about so many things. Um, I just want to ask you like a personal question now. Yeah. What gives you the most happiness and fulfillment in your life at this point? Mm. Mm. I have to separate things from the other ones, but uh, having a daughter is 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 very it's a it's a huge lesson. It's a lesson to accept and love her unconditionally, and not to have to let go expectations. Because when she was growing up, when I was being a mom, I didn't know how to be a man, or maybe I knew how to be a mom. I had all these things in my mind, mm -hmm. but now it's more like it's more like let go. She is who she is, and she's a sacred, sacred being, and she has a sacred path. So I know it's a sacred path that she has, unique, like every single one of us. So it brings me joy to the fact to see that she's herself, and that she's loving very much being here, and that she's another sacred person in my life. And it brings me joy when I have interactions with her, when we text with her, when we don't text with her. <laughs> so, so, and being by friends, I love, I have a social life and I love being with friends. And I love taking care of people. I love taking care of people that needs taking care of. If somebody fell down or somebody's sick or somebody has surgery or somebody needs someone in there, I say, I go, I go. The first one to say to it's it's rewarding and it's very enriched and it's it's bring me a lot of happiness. It bring me joy. It really does just to be able to be there with the person that's in need of some company or doesn't matter. Nice. Yeah, that's really profound. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank so you if much. people wanted to connect with you, where's the best place for them to connect? The best place will be my email address, luzordo at gmail. Okay. Yes. L-U-Z-O-R-D at gmail.com. Okay. All right. And then I think you gave me um, a website too. The, that... for, the, mm -hmm, for photography? I'm sorry. Okay. Yes. yes. <laughs> a, it will be luzride.wordpress.com. Okay, great. And then there's the Wild Atlanta site yeah. also where your book is. And there's wildatlanta.net. Yes. Okay, wildatlanta.net. So we'll yes. make sure, I'll make sure and put that in the show notes so people can find <laughs> you afterwards you. too. Thank so, you. Yeah, thank you so much for being on the podcast and for sharing your stories. And, you know, you're just a beautiful soul. Just your mm. presence here is just so mm. nice to feel and to <laughs> see and to experience. So thank you so much. Kimberly has been a big pleasure to meet you and thank you for inviting me to this space that we're sharing right now and uh, grateful, very grateful. Thank you. You're welcome. So I have one last question before we finish. What is your best advice on living an incredible, amazing life? Mm. I think that one of the best things that happens to me was to realize that I don't have to be doing something all the time. That it's good to just stop doing something for, for a while period of time. Um, I grew up thinking that I had to be doing something. I had to write or I had to take photos or I had to clean or I had to cook or I had to have to have to have. No, I don't. No, 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 no. I don't have to. I just can sit here. And feel well about it. Don't forget it. <laughs> <laughs> feel well about it. Feel happy that you can have the time not to have to do something. And the other thing will be volunteer. Volunteer, help others, be there, be in service. 
if you have the chance to do it. Now, that's a, for me, it's a complete full life. And go out, go out with nature. <laughs> go out with nature. Stay Thank free. you so much, Luz. And uh, we'll talk to you again soon. My pleasure. Bye-bye.